Oh, man. Well, uh, huge, huge thanks for, for, um, for welcoming me and how fun to be introduced by Brock. Uh, a visionary and one that brings a joy and elan uh, to the work and an honor to be after Doria, uh, one of so many community leaders across California manifesting this vision of restoration of nature and restoration of justice uh, together. It's a true honor to be uh, addressing Bioneers, and I'll share that my gateway to Bioneers was a legendary Bioneer named Bob Russell. Bob Russell was an environmental activist in northern Michigan, a dear friend of my dad's, and he and his partner Sally hosted many of the satellite Bioneers conferences for a very long time. He passed away in 2013, and ironically, the first Bioneers that I attended was a, a year after his death. But I just want to say for folks, if it's your first time or you've been here for those 36 years, your leadership is why people in positions like mine can do the work that we do. You all have been, it's true. You all have been innovating ideas, building movements, uh, driving advocacy that enables us to be, in some cases, where we, where we are today. Now, make no mistake, we've talked a lot about it over the last day. We are in tumultuous times. We're in alarming times. It's dis discouraging times. And, and I'm reminded to, it's important to, for all of us to, to, to remember why we do the work. So I want to tell you my why. I describe my why as working to help people and nature thrive together as one. And I borrowed that uh, motto, or used that motto, from one of my favorite foundations or philanthropies, the Pisces Foundation. But then I added that phrase, and one, uh, because a tribal leader and now friend of mine, Frankie Myers, stopped me cold at a presentation and said, people and nature are not two separate things. Nature are people. Na people are, are nature. You need, to, you need to recognize that they're together. So it was an incredible moment a year later when we got to move into a new headquarters building in, in Sacramento, and I got to choose the quote on the wall uh, when you come into our, our lobby. And I chose a, a, po a quote by the, the poet Gary Snyder, and it says, nature is not a place to visit, it is home, right? And we know, uh, we know to a person that nature needs us and, and we need nature. So I want to talk about what that means to somebody who's working in government. And I'll say I'm so refreshed to look at this agenda and see almost no people like, that do jobs like me. Uh, because most conferences I go to are policy speak and political platitudes, etc. You all are on the, on, the, uh, on the front lines making this work, but I want to tell you something encouraging. And I think it's important to have in encouragement uh, at this time. I call it hope with an action plan. And the fact is, Nature is finding its way centrally into the work of governments, not only in California, across the United States, and across the world, and big things are happening. So let me skip to the big things, because I think it's really exciting to share with you that after a decadal movement by tribal leaders in California, the largest river restoration project in American history is complete in the Klamath River Basin. Four dams, four defunct dams have been removed that's restoring over 400 miles of salmon habitat. Critically, critically, important, critically important to the survival of salmon and the survival of the Yurok and the Karuk people, salmon people. And I can tell you that institutions like the agency that I lead for decades told tribal leaders that it would never happen. It could never happen. And it was that steadfastness of, of tribal leaders and their vision that brought together governors, the interior secretary of the United States, even Warren Buffett to take down those dams. But here's the most remarkable thing. Those dams came down in the fall, and biologists, fish biologists said, it's going to take a, a handful of years to understand if salmon are actually going to recolonize this, uh, uh, this, this watershed that are actually going to uh, come back in. You know how long it took? Ten days. <laughs> Ten days. 6,000 6, salmon were, uh, were monitored 10 days later getting through that first dam. And it was 10 weeks later that the first salmon were identified far up into Oregon in the, in the top headwaters of the, of the restored habitat. Nature is resilient if we give it half a chance. 
Go 400 miles to the south to Los Angeles where we're nearing completion of construction on what we think is the world's largest land-based wildlife crossing, the Wallace-Annenberg Crossing, connecting two, to connecting two critical habitats uh, for or areas of habitat for the endangered Southern California mountain lion. That's a wildlife crossing that's crossing 10 lanes of traffic and uh, a, a two-lane two -lane frontage road uh, and that, that, that took over a decade of advocacy led by an incredible environmental activist named Beth Pratt from the National Wildlife Federation. And guess what? That has in common with Klamath. Many people, most people said it could never get done. It was too big, it was too audacious, it was too complicated, could never happen. And now we're about to get it done. The fact is, great things are happening across California and our country. The California condor is back. I was up with the Yurok biologists releasing California condor into their native habitat in far northern California. The gray wolves are back in California uh, and, and have, uh, have made their way into the, into the southern Sierra. And yes, the beavers are back. And I can tell you, and I can tell you that Brock and his, his partner at his organization, Kate Lundquist, are the reasons why beavers are back. So let's talk about why nature is important in California. Uh, California is one of, of the world's biodiversity hotspots. Scientists say 30, one of 36 hotspots in the world. We have uh, more uh, endemic species in California than almost any place on Earth. 40% of our plant species in California only grow in California. We talk a lot about our culture, cultural diversity, which is an incredible thing to celebrate, and we have this biodiversity. And we have this incredible outdoors that is the reason why many of us came to California in the first place. The largest state park system in the country. Uh, opportunities to get outdoors uh, that, that few places in, in the world have. But we also rely on our nature and our natural systems. Our natural systems are what keep us together and alive. We talk about ecosystems and sometimes we think eco means environment, this is fish and wildlife. Eco means, is the Greek um, translation of home. These are our home systems. So those watersheds that we're working to protect are providing our water. And when those watersheds burn up in catastrophic wildfire like they have uh, in the, over the past decade, that is a huge threat to our, our, our life as humans in, in California. So yes, we're protecting nature for biodiversity. Yes, we're protecting nature for non-human life, but we're also protecting nature uh, for ourselves. And that's really been the aha moment in the last decade where across the world, scientists have told us that yes, attacking climate change is about solar energy and electric vehicles and building efficiency, but it's also about protecting and restoring nature. It was 10 years ago next month that the legendary conservationist biologist E.O. Wilson stood on this very stage before he published the, the book uh, Half Earth. And he called for us to protect, conserve, restore half of the earth as the way that we're going to actually invest in the future, not only uh, of all animals and life forms, but our, our own species. And since that time, we now understand and uh, our processes that bring together people across the world on climate change understand nature is critical. And in fact, in 2022, the foremost scientists across the world, they formed something called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They came together and they said there's five important things that you need to do in the next 10 years to try to stabilize climate change. And three of those were nature-based solutions. We're restoring nature, we're protecting nature, and we're improving agricultural practices. Because we know that nature-based solutions are now central to the work that we're doing uh, protecting, protecting planet Earth and combating climate change. So, what does that look like in California, and, and how does that translate uh, across the world? I am so proud to share with you that California is part of a global movement called 30 by 30. Now, E.O. Wilson set the bar high with half Earth, 50%, and we're not quite there yet. But what we've committed ourselves to is be part of a global movement to protect a third of the Earth, restore a third of the Earth by 2030, and this is called 30 by 30. Governor Newsom, answered the call of activists that were calling on California to step up and actually sign on the dotted line for 30 by 30. He established an executive order back in 2020. Uh, our state legislature followed suit two years later and adopted it as a state law. And then, believe it or not, this United Nations process that brings together 
uh, countries from around the world on biodiversity agreed uh, in 2022 in Montreal on a set of commitments that included 30 by 30 uh, for the world. What's exciting about California, though, is we're not just aspiring to some big idea. We're getting it done in California. So we held ourselves to a really strong standard of what it means to, to protect our lands and our coastal waters. And then we're holding ourselves accountable for getting there. And over the last two years, well, three years, we've achieved expanded, expanded that, those conserved protected areas by 1.5 million acres of land. So you know places. You know places like, uh, of course, Yosemite and Big Sur, but th there's a movement happening across California driven by land trusts and resource conservation districts and NGOs and local governments to conserve land locally, all in service to this big idea of 30 by 30. And we're making progress. We're also adopting what we think, or we have adopted what we think are the strongest nature-based solution targets in the world. So not only saying, yes, nature needs to be part of our mandate our state law to achieve carbon neutrality or net zero in the next 20 years by 2045, but nature has to actually be part of that. And we know that nature, when it's cared for in our landscapes, when they're healthy, are incredible sequesters of carbon. They remove and store carbon. But when they're unhealthy, like catastrophic wildfire, they're, re they're releasing emissions. We also know that healthy landscape buffer climate impacts whether they're floodplains that, that can take water from the rivers seasonally to reduce downriver floods, or whether they're urban greening in Los Angeles to, to address this terrible inequity where parts of Los Angeles are literally 10 degrees cooler in the hotter, hotter months because they have more trees and, and urban greening. So we know that nature-based solutions make sense in California. Now we're holding ourselves accountable with 81 specific targets to achieve these nature-based solutions, whether it's getting 30 million acres of land healthier to avoid catastrophic wildfire risk in the next 20 years, or getting 4 million new trees in the ground. Just two of these 81 very, very specific targets. We're also really excited to recognize that while conserving, restoring nature is important, we have to build connectivity. I mentioned the Klamath Dam's removal and this, this land-based bridge. We have to do a lot more of that. We have to build a system of connectivity. And we've got a remarkable public-private partnership driven by nonprofits called California Wildlife Reconnected to do that, just that. I want to, lastly, on the policy side, share maybe something I'm most proud of being a part of, and that is our tribal nature-based solutions. Three months after he took office, Governor Newsom invited California tribal leaders to the future height of, future site of the Native American Heritage Center, this, this new tribal gathering place in Sacramento, and did something that no California governor had ever done. He offered an unconditional apology for state government's treatment of tribes. And he read, <laughs> and he read, he read from the inaugural address of California's first governor, where that governor put a financial bounty on the head of Native women and children a state-sanctioned policy of genocide. And it was easily the most uh, meaningful and impactful day in my career. But we talked about with the tribal leaders that if that's all that happened, it was important, importantly symbolic, but it was ultimately counterproductive because we needed to actually create a new, a new future. So we've been holding ourselves accountable over the last five years to create that new future. And what, is that, what does that future look like? It looks like ancestral land return, land back, it looks like it looks like co-stewardship, co-management of our lands, and it looks like restoring traditional ecological practices that we now desperately need in California. And and those are good. Those are those are those are fine commitments. But I'm really proud to tell you that we're making progress. We allocated 107 million dollars to ancestral land return, and have now facilitated 30,000 plus acres of land back to tribes. California State Parks manages 1.6 million acres of land across California. Now 57% of those lands and state parks are governed by co-management and co-stewardship agreements with Native American tribes. And we are finally getting out of the way of uh, tribes in getting good fire, cultural fire, back on the landscape, which we desperately need in California. 
So this is happening, and this will continue to happen. And I want to tell you that as we pick up the paper, or as we do now, uh, doom scroll uh, in the beginning of the day or the end of the night, just know that progress is being made, and it's not just being made in California. I had a chance to lead a delegation from California of activists and tribal leaders and local government leaders to Cali, Colombia uh, in the fall, where we came together with countries from around the world under the United Nations Compact Convention on Biodiversity. And I can tell you, governments from around the world are doing things that uh, make these, this progress look modest. And we have a network of, of, of efforts among progressive governments. And I can tell you this, this linkage between restoration of the environment and restoration of justice, indigenous-led, it's, it's found its way, in, as it should, into these governmental discussions. And it's actually guiding our path forward. So my message is, in this dark, dangerous hour, don't despair. This, this is the moment that Bioneers was created for. You all have persisted over three decades in times like this, and we can continue to make more progress. And I want to end with a story, and it's one of my favorite stories. The San Joaquin riparian brush rabbit is this cute little rabbit uh, that has lived in the, in the Central Valley, uh, the San Joaquin Valley. And as its name suggests, it lives along the rivers. It lives in those riparian zones, woodsy areas along the rivers. And we've lost 96% of our riparian habitat in the Central Valley. And we thought we lost the San Joaquin riparian brush rabbit until they found a breeding pair taking shelter uh, under an overpass of Highway 99. We think down to the last, the last breeding pair. And that breeding pair was brought into uh, what's called captive breeding, where they help uh, you know, generate more population into the dozens. And then they uh, reintroduced that uh, rabbit into national wildlife refuges, those places that, that are protected in the San Joaquin Valley. Not a lot of them, but protected. Well, fast forward, an, uh, an incredible nonprofit named River Partners that does these multi-benefit restoration projects bought an area of land at the confluence of the San Joaquin and the Tuolumne Rivers. And the goal was uh, buy it from agricultural production and rewild it for this type of habitat, this riparian habitat. And it's an amazing story because we caught wind of this effort and we decided to see if they would help us make it a state park. And now it's the newest state park, the first new state park in California in over a decade. And, and it happens to be in a, in a part of California that's park poor, where you have uh, low-income farm worker communities that literally uh, have limited access to touch the rivers uh, and recreate in the rivers when it's 110 degrees in the Central Valley. So it's amazing that this is becoming a state park. And so in the course of that, they were doing biological surveys to prepare for the reintroduction of the brush rabbit. Because in an exciting way, we can move the, the, or bring, the, bring the brush rabbit population from several miles up on the other side of the river uh, to, to what we're calling Dos Rios, the state park, and, and reintroduce it. And uh, during that, um, that biological survey, um, within that newly repaired uh, riparian zone, only three and a half years old, you know what they found? Riparian brush rabbits. <laughs> Somehow these incredible bunnies had figured out a way to travel 10 miles and across the river uh, to find their new home at Dos Rios. So to me, that says never give up hope. Always recognize that nature can rebound if we help nature. And this is our moment. So thank you very much for what you do. Keep up the great work. <laughs>